and OpenCL Sphere and OpenCL HLM will probably ship their first specifications uh, during 2012. So then we have the video and audio acceleration APIs. Eric is going to give us more detail later on this afternoon. But just to give you uh, the high-level snapshot, uh, we have OpenSLES and OpenMaxAL designed to work together uh, for rich media, video, camera, and image processing applications uh, and advanced audio. OpenMaxAL um, provides a lot of functionality uh, for camera control, for image pipeline processing, for video processing. And I think OpenMax AL is the API that has been designed for use by application developers. And it's going to enable a lot of rich applications that are just now coming onto mobile platforms. Advanced image capture and computational photography, uh, HD playback with DRM uh, protection, and augmented reality, where the video processing needs to be very closely connected to the graphics processing. And we'll look at more detail about that in a second. OpenSLES uh, has OpenGLES is for graphics, OpenSLES is for sound. So everything that OpenGLES does for 3D, OpenSLES does for audio, including 3D positional uh, audio. So advanced audio functionality that can be easily ported from platform to platform. OpenSLES and OpenMaxAL are both object-oriented, simple for the application programmer to use, very portable code across different platforms. And the two APIs use the same object-oriented framework. So you can write an application that uses OpenSLES and OpenMax AL, and where there's the overlap in the middle for audio functionality, you can use either API, and your code is uh, pretty portable. And Eric will give us more uh, details. But this is the kind of multimedia use case you can have OpenMax AL uh, um, inputting a rich media file with audio and video with AV sync. Uh, you can split the audio path off to OpenSLES for advanced processing, for example, 3D positional uh, processing, and split off the uh, video stream uh, through EGL uh, uh, into OpenGLES for, for processing, and then EGL finally for rendering uh, to the display. Now, OpenSLES and OpenMax AL are now uh, a standard part of the Android platform. I'm sure many of you here are working uh, with Android. Um, so it's good news that, and that Google are beginning to adopt uh, these standard APIs. It provides more portability for application uh, developers. Um, and they're part of the NDK uh, inside uh, the Android uh, platform. So let's look briefly at uh, augmented reality. Uh, we use augmented reality, we talk about it a lot inside Kronos. It's an example application um, that needs a lot of the different APIs that we create to work together. So it's kind of a, the dream use case, or, or perhaps the nightmare use case, where your graphics and your camera and your video all have to be working uh, together very efficiently. I'm sure many of you are familiar with augmented reality using vision. Um, but in, in summary, you have the camera on your mobile device bringing in the live video stream from the environment. You pass the video to a tracking system that is using feature and object tracking in the scene to position the mobile device relative to the scene. So you can take 3D objects and augment the video stream and it looks like the 3D objects are actually part of the video. It means that you need very precise tracking. It, needs you, it means you need to be able to mix video and graphics in a very um, sophisticated way. 
So what are some of the problems that we have if we want to implement augmented reality using complete acceleration, nothing running on the CPU uh, unless it's the, just the application itself. All the video and graphics processing, you want to offload it uh, from the CPU onto hardware acceleration. Well, the first problem is we need to be able to have the video and the graphics interoperating. So we might have our camera being controlled by OpenMax AL. OpenMax AL doing the low level image pipeline processing close to the camera sensor. And we want to get that video stream over to OpenGL ES. In the past, it's been quite hard to do that in a portable way that doesn't include a CPU copy. Well, now we have EGL Stream. EGL Stream is a, an extension to EGL 1.4. It provides the functionality to, to, to route a sequence or a stream of video frames from one subsystem to another. So in this example, the OpenMax uh, AL subsystem is the stream producer. It's creating a sequence of video frames that flow into the stream, and then the OpenGL ES subsystem is the um, stream consumer. That's where the sequence of frames are headed to and are consumed. OpenGL ES has the concept of an external texture, which provides for format conversion in the hardware from, for example, YUV, if you have a YUV camera, uh, into the OpenGL ES texture format, which is in RGB. It, it happens magically under the API, protect external texture, and that's deliberate because it enables the hardware GPU vendor to do that conversion in whatever way they want. It, they can do it in a way that is best for their hardware architecture. But for the developer, it's great. You can take a video frame and you can load it in to uh, an OpenGL ES texture and the format is converted automatically. And in the middle now we have this EGL stream. It's very simple to use for the developer. Again, a lot of the details are hidden underneath the API, which gives the hardware implementer the freedom to implement this transfer in the way that's best for their particular hardware. We don't mandate how the hardware does this. The only important thing is that it, it, it happens underneath this high-level API. So the EGL Stream API gives the developer quite a lot of control how the stream is operating. You can put the stream in different modes. You can have a straight FIFO mode. You can give the application control to latch and reuse a particular frame. And the mode will depend on the kind of application that you're trying to create. But it's, it's high-level control, uh, simple for the developers to use, portable code because it's high-level, it will run easily on different systems. And uh, all of the complexity and the synchronization uh, is hidden underneath the API in the implementation itself. So the next uh, opportunity we have is for um, using advanced sensors in a device. We have lots of sensors now beginning to appear in mobile devices. Uh, cameras, uh, inertial sensors, uh, gyros, GPS, compass, barometer, um, and increasingly, you know, people wanting to use the cameras in very sophisticated ways. The applications need to be able to use this hardware, um, make the applications magically aware of the uh, environment of the mobile device, but they need to write that uh, software in a portable way. And that is uh, what Stream Input is aiming to achieve. So Stream Input has the concept of high-level semantic sensor information. So the application can be written by just requesting semantic information, receiving that information, without having to worry about the, the camera type and the manufacturer of the gyro and lots of low-level details 
that were destroying portability. So you can, for example, ask for, uh, if you're doing a connect type game, you can ask for skeleton tracking information. Or if you're doing a camera or photography type application, you might ask for you know, facial tracking, facial recognition. Um, you can also create virtual sensors, say a sensor that will call back to the application if it finds the device is in an elevator, or it's being driven in an automobile, or it's being carried in a hip pocket, or it's being carried in a backpack. Now, the sensor manufacturers know how to generate that level of information. We just need an API that lets the application request and receive that information back from the sensor network. So stream input will create a sensor processing network to do the low level processing on the sensors that can provide that semantic level uh, feedback. We want to avoid applications having to use the individual sensors because that uh, destroys the opportunity for sensor fusion, where the sensor manufacturers know best how to take the input from multiple sensors and create a high quality semantic stream to the application. We're also addressing a problem that many others have ignored until now, that we have many different sensors, but how do you synchronize them? If you have a gyro and a camera, and they're both being used for positioning in an augmented reality application, for example, you need to know where they are in time, else your one sensor will be displaced in time from your uh, camera sensor, and your application will not behave correctly. So Stream Input has the concept of timestamps on every sensor, including the camera, uh, so the application can use the sensor input uh, in a correct temporal fashion. So it sounds like an ambitious uh, API, but we have the right people in the industry to really make this happen. For example, you know, many of you are familiar with the Kinect uh, from Microsoft. Well, the depth camera technology provider in the Kinect is PrimeSense from Israel. Uh, they are a member of this working group. They have the OpenNI proprietary API for controlling the Connect. Um, they've contributed that API as an input to this process. We have SoftKinetic, who's PrimeSense's biggest competitor in depth camera technology. They're also uh, participating. They've actually just been voted the specification editor. We have people like Sensor Platforms, uh, middleware vendors, very experienced in inertial sensor middleware. Lots of silicon vendors, lots of camera vendors. So we, I think we have the right skill set to create an API that can really enable the industry to make better use of these rich sensors. We have the Computer Vision Working Group, uh, which is our newest working group. Uh, doesn't even have a formal name. We're calling the API right now CVHAL, which is Computer Vision hardware acceleration layer. That's not the final marketing name. We'll, we'll think of a better name than that. Um, but we're currently, we've just started meetings, and we're discussing what the scope of work will be. And once we've decided and agreed on the scope of work, we'll be able to pick a suitable name. But the idea is quite simple. There have been open source libraries for computer vision uh, for some time. OpenCV is probably the best known. It's a very large body of open source, um, very sophisticated, extensive vision processing functionality. But there's no API to get that accelerated. It typically runs on the CPU. It's a C code, not so much a C code. The mobile industry in particular needs now that vision functionality trackers, recognizers, to be hardware accelerated. And there's no API to make that simple. You could port it over OpenCL, but you know, that's uh, a lot of work that 
a lot of people probably won't be able to afford a slightly higher level API specifically tuned for vision that the silicon vendors can implement is going to make it a lot easier for the software community. So we're designing a hardware acceleration layer that can be used by libraries like OpenCV and other libraries to, uh, or, or directly by an application that wishes to tap directly into this acceleration. So this vision and sensor processing is becoming a very active area inside Kronos. And we have this, this stack where you could use all of these APIs together. You might use OpenCL to implement CD how You don't have to, it's a choice. Um, but we're gonna make sure that that's you know, uh, a good way to implement OpenCV um, how if you have OpenCL on your system. You'll be able to accelerate third-party open source libraries like OpenCV using CV how You're gonna be able to use high-level vision libraries like OpenCV for your camera processing nodes in a stream input graph. So you can take the output from your vision tracker in an OpenCV library and pass it to the application using stream input. Also, we have the APIs in the Kronos ecosystem that you can use as peers to CV how. For example, if you want to bring in camera input, you might choose to use OpenMax AL. Again, you don't have to. You can use your own camera subsystem. But if you want an open standard that gives portability, OpenMax AL has sophisticated camera input processing, and you can pipe that into CV how through EGL streams. And if you want graphics together with your vision processing or general compute processing, you're going to make sure that CV how inter interoperates well with OpenGL, OpenGLES, and OpenCL, again, using EGL streams. <coughs> so now for the first time, we're able to draw an augmented reality processing graph using entirely open standards. So we need camera processing and low-level imaging. We'd use OpenMax AL. We need to tap that video stream into a vision tracker. We can implement that tracker with uh, CV HAL or OpenCL. We need to take in all the other sensors in a system, the, the gyros, etc., fuse them together for the application. That's the domain of stream input. We need to generate uh, the 3D augmentations for the display. Uh, that would be OpenGLES, and OpenGLES can do the composition of the video and the graphics. We need to route that video stream into the 3D GPU, that's EGL streams, and there'll be audio, perhaps 3D positional audio, and that is OpenSLES. So we've only been able to, to draw this diagram with 100% open standards for just a few months. It's very new, so this is kind of the leading edge of what we're trying to achieve with open standards. Now, open standards are great, uh, but they need to be shipped in systems, and uh, the good news is that Android is a platform for innovation for many of us. Um, open, uh, a lot of these APIs are now beginning to ship uh, in Android, the NDK. Um, open SL, sorry, Open GL ES has been available since Android 2.2. Open SL ES started shipping in Android 2.3. Open Max AL now shipping in Android 4.0, Ice Cream Sandwich. Uh, EGL has actually been in Android for a long time, but it hasn't been directly exposed to developers. But that's beginning to change, uh, and the Android beginning to expose EGL directly to NDK uh, developers. And I think EGL streams, again, will be uh, the extension that gets most widely used. Now, Google is not yet using OpenCL or Stream Input or CV Hal, um, but we're hoping we just continue to do a good job in developing these APIs, we'll be able to add value to the Android platform, and Google, perhaps, will eventually uh, adopt them. In the meantime, because the NDK, because Android is an open system, hardware vendors can ship these APIs 
as extensions to the NDK. I think we all need to be careful not to fragment Android. Uh, so we need to make sure that we don't break the APIs uh, that, are, that Google are defining. But we can add and extend those APIs uh, to provide differentiating functionality, but using open standards, so they're not uh, proprietary. Then my last section here is about HTML5. Uh, this diversity of devices getting broader and broader. And we have this chance to create a cross-platform programming environment that spans different operating systems. But if HTML5 is going to genuinely be uh, a rich cross-platform environment, HTML5 needs to adopt and expose a lot of this rich functionality that we've been talking about in native APIs. We have multi-core CPUs, we have rich GPUs, you know, GPU computing, multiple HD cameras, image processing, vision processing, all these things you can't yet do in your web browser. So how can the, the browser vendors quickly get these APIs? Well, one way we think is a positive way is to leverage this work that we've been doing in the native APIs and let's expose it into the web browser. We have WebGL, it's a good example. It's a JavaScript binding directly into OpenGL ES. And we have WebCL now, the working group defining a JavaScript binding into OpenCL. There are initiatives like Web Audio from Google and we're beginning to work with Google to make sure we can accelerate web audio on top of open Max, And then there are other possible uh, cooperation projects. And Kronos and the W3C are beginning to talk to see whether we can actually form working groups for some of these projects. Um, perhaps a web Max to enable advanced camera and image processing in, in the browser. Um, web VL to tap into um, the CV HAL acceleration layer for vision processing and using stream input for advanced sensor processing uh, in the web browser. These are just ideas, we're discussing them, but I think uh, some of these ideas will, will actually uh, be progress. But WebGL is our first web API. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen WebGL examples. Uh, it's beginning to deploy quite widely all of the production browsers now beginning to have uh, WebGL, uh, with the exception of Microsoft, and we hope that they will adopt very soon. And I think this year, you will see the mobile browsers beginning to uh, deploy uh, WebGL. So WebGL has been done at Kronos. A lot of people ask us, why is Kronos doing WebGL? Uh, why not the W3C? That's where the other web standards uh, are often defined. I think WebGL is kind of special. Uh, it's a very close link between the WebGL API and the OpenGL ES2 functionality in the GPU. And it's working out really well to have the GPU vendors and the browser vendors around the same table under the same IP framework cooperating really closely uh, to truly enable 3D functionality in the browser. Um, the WebGL working group is already having a very fundamental impact on the design of next generation OpenGL and OpenGL ES. Uh, considerations for security, multitasking, are beginning to feed from WebGL uh, into the native APIs. So it's a very productive partnership. And then our latest web API is WebCL, uh, parallel computing uh, for the web. And um, this is not a commitment yet from the browser vendors, uh, though they are participating in the working group. Uh, so I'm hopeful that the browser vendors will uh, deploy this. And computing graphics together is important, just like it is in native space. And I have a short video here. Let me show this. So we have prototype implementations 
uh, of WebCL. This is a prototype from Samsung. This one happens to be running on Safari or on, on a Mac. Um, so just like native games, very often the compute and graphics go hand in hand, and you need both for advanced applications. So this is a standard open uh, WebGL. This is running in a browser. So it's not a native application. Um, so this is a standard open GLES application uh, a virtual environments. But now we've turned on dynamic deformation of these objects. They've been a jelly and they're wobbling. Um, but we're doing the computation in JavaScript. The floating point computations are killing the JavaScript interpreter and the frame rate dropped right down. Now if we take those floating point calculations using WebCL over onto the GPU, you can see that the frame rate goes from one frame a second to back up to over 100 frames a second. Uh, so we're getting compute in the browser together with graphics. So you might use this kind of compute in a real game. You would perhaps use your physics engine, would use WebCL for acceleration. So you can see the difference. JavaScript on the left and WebCL on the right. Um, we're beginning to put the pieces together to truly enable native class gaming and 3D applications in your web browser, any web browser that has HTML5 capability. So, it's very interesting just to watch how these uh, APIs begin to evolve. We have these native APIs. You can be put them into different uh, functional quadrants. We have the 3D APIs, we have the compute APIs, we have now the vision and video APIs, and the sensor APIs. And then we expand out to web. Well, we have WebGL for 3D, we have the WebCL for compute. We don't yet have projects in place for bringing sensor and vision processing into the web. But as I say, I think we'll see some of these projects beginning to be formed over the next year or two. So that's it for my uh, overview. I um, just want to wrap up. Um, hopefully we've shown you why uh, APIs are key to enabling uh, rich and interesting applications on advanced uh, hardware. These APIs are the way that the software community uh, communicate with advanced uh, accelerator silicon. But these APIs can no longer exist in isolation, we need these APIs to be working very closely together and interoperating. And finally, it's not just native APIs anymore, it's web APIs, because we want to deploy this functionality not just on native platforms, we want to deploy them in the web browser for a very portable application development. And then last but not least, as we started out, if this is of interest to your company and your company is not a member of the Kronos Group yet, you would be very welcome uh, to join and you know, help us in the industry you know, create uh, these solutions that will drive the industry forward and be good for your business. Thank you very much.